Hello, my name is Mustafa and I'm a medical doctor and this is a high quality free resource for learning nephrology. Please like this video so it reaches more people and here we will talk about the membranous nephropathy. It is also called the membranous glomerulonephritis and it is one of the diseases that lead to nephrotic syndrome. Same with the minimal chain disease and the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, which are also explained in the same playlist, the nephrology playlist that you can access from a link in the description of this video. So let's start with an overview. So membranous nephropathy is the second most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults, the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis being the most common. And it is most common in men older than 40 years and it is usually people of European origins. Now let's talk about the etiology of the disease. So we have two types, we have the primary type and we have the secondary type. The primary is idiopathic and it accounts for 70% of the cases and the secondary one is secondary to many, many different conditions. The first one being the systemic lupus erythematosus. So lupus could lead to membranous in some cases and in other cases it lead to lupus nephritis which is a nephritic syndrome type of disorder. And the membranous is also secondary to solid tumors like colon cancer, lung cancer and melanoma. And it is secondary to infections like hepatitis B, hepatitis C and syphilis. And sometimes it is secondary to drugs like penicillamine and gold and sometimes to nesates. Now let's talk about the pathogenesis of the membranous. So the primary type is an autoimmune disease. It is mediated by IgG antibodies. They are autoantibodies directed to the phospholipase A2 receptor, which is also known as the PLA2R receptor on the border sites. This attack leads to thickening of the glomerular basement membrane, which will be obvious on the light microscopy while examining a biopsy of this disease. The secondary type, on the other hand, is due to direct injury to the glomerular basement membrane by the factors that we mentioned in the previous slide, infections and tumors and uh, drugs. So when they injure the basement membrane, they lead to thickening, same with the primary type. So th this is a simplified drawing to make the pathogenesis of the membranes easier to understand. So here we have the blood urine barrier. So this is here the blood and this is the urine side in the glomerulus. And we have three layers. The first one being the capillary wall of the glomerulus. The second one being the glomerular basement membrane here. And the third one is the border sites. And in the membranous uh, nephropathy disease, there is thickening of the glomerular basement membrane. As we can see here, it becomes thickened. And that's why it is called membranous because the membrane becomes thicker than normal. If we take a renal biopsy from a patient with membranous, we find about that on the light microscopy, it shows thickened glomerular basement membrane and that is why it is called membranous, as we mentioned. The immunofluorescence would show deposition of granular IgG and C3 complement on the glomerular basement membrane. And the electron microscopy would show sub-epithelial depositions and which, are, which will show as spike and dome appearance on the electron microscopy. Now let's talk about the biophysiology of the membranous. So the membranous lead to proteinuria. That is because of the thickened glomerular basement membrane. This would impair the filtration process that occur in the kidneys and this would lead to passing of proteins to the urine, which lead to proteinuria and frothy urine. And this would decrease the serum protein and one of the proteins that are lost in the urine are the immunoglobulins and because they are related to immunity, 
So when they are lost, they would make this, the individual more susceptible to infections. Another proteins that are lost are the coagulation and the anticoagulation proteins. One of these proteins is the antithrombin-3. The antithrombin-3 is responsible for deactivating the active forms of factor 2, factor 9, factor 10, factor 11, and factor 12. And because it is lost, this would make the individual more susceptible to thrombosis. Now, as a reaction to decreasing the protein, the serum protein, this would make the liver react by producing more proteins and lipids, and this would lead to hyperlipidemia and fatty casts in the urine. One of the major proteins that are lost is the albumin, and albumin is related to the anchoatic pressure. We have two types of pressure in the circulation. We have the hydrostatic pressure. This pressure is produced by the heart to push the blood in the circulation. The other type of pressure is the anchoatic pressure. Uh, it is responsible for keeping the blood in the circulation. And once it is lost, this would lead to the fluid in the circulation shifting from the intravascular and into the fluids. And this would lead to edema. Because of the fluid shifting due to decrease the plasma anchoatic pressure, this would lead to decreasing the intravascular volume. And as a reaction to the decreasing the intravascular volume, the kidneys would activate the running angiotensin aldosterone system in order to bring more fluids into the circulation. And as a result of the activation of the RAS, this would lead to hypertension because of the uh, sodium and water retention. And because of that, it would also lead to aggravation of the edema. So during a relapse of the membranous nephropathy disease, uh, your patient would present to you with hypertension, edema, hyperlipidemia, fatty casts, thrombosis maybe, or infection. Now let's talk about the presentation of the membranous nephropathy. So it presents with nephrotic syndrome symptoms like frothy urine, beating edema, as we mentioned, and it is worse in lower extremities. And it is also associated with periorbital edema, which is a swelling of the area around the eyes as seen in this picture. Sometimes it presents with abdominal pain due to ascites, severe hypovolemia, peritonitis, mercuriatitis, thrombosis, or steroid-induced gastritis. It presents with hypertension, and patients may develop white nails in bands, which are called the Marquis lines during relapses, as you see in this picture. So we have multiple lines, and between the lines is white, so they are called the uh, Marquis lines or the Marquis nails. And patients may develop xanthomas and xanthlasmas because of the hyperlipidemia. And it is important to mention that these symptoms mostly appear during relapses. The patient is mostly normal during remissions or during areas of the disease is mild. But when it relapses, the patient would be present with these symptoms. Now let's talk about the diagnosis. So we would find about the nephrotic range of protein urea through the urine domestic testing that would show three pluses or four pluses. 24 hour urine protein is more than 3.5 grams. The urine protein creatinine ratio of more than three. And we would do comprehensive metabolic panel looking for hypoalbuminemia. And the serum albumin would be less than three in case of the hypoalbuminemia. We would also do renal function test, which include the blood urea nitrogen and the creatinine, looking for renal dysfunction, and serum electrolytes, looking for calcium and other, and other electrolytes changes, because those are bound to proteins, and, and once the proteins are lost, the, this, their values would change. So you would look for the changes in the values, and you would supply them back to the patient. And you would find about the mild hyponatremia during relapses. And in the membranous, the patient is not losing complements, so they would be normal. 
and you send the patient for PLA to our antibodies, which would be positive in 70 to 80 percent of patient in a primary membranous cases, and these antibodies with the nephrotic syndrome presentation are enough for membranous diagnosis. There is no need of biopsy. And the hepatitis serology testing, looking for any hepatitis infection because those would be secondary causes of the disease. And there would be elevated hemoglobin and hematocrit levels and thrombocytosis are usually found during relapse as a result of the plasma volume contraction. And the confirmatory test is a renal biopsy and it is done in patients that doesn't have autoantibodies positive in their serum. So we would do renal biopsy to confirm their diagnosis. Regarding prognosis, one third of the patients with idiopathic membranous undergo spontaneous remission and one third remain in nephrotic state and one third develop progressive chronic kidney disease. 15% of the patients with membranous progress to end stage renal disease in five years if untreated and 40% at 15 years. The risk factors for progression to end stage renal disease are the elderly patients, the male gender, and more than 8 grams of proteinuria at the presentation, and tubular interstitial fibrosis on biopsy. You always give supportive therapy to membranous disease patients. That includes strict blood pressure management under 130 over 80 millimeter mercury using ACEs or ARPs and hyperlipidemia treated with statins, edema treated with sodium restriction and diuretics, thrombophilia treated with anticoagulation, and infections treated with antibiotics. Finally, let's talk about the treatment. So the primary membranous is that the patient treated if they have risk factor from the fa factors that we mentioned in the previous slide, or they have nephrotic syndrome that can't be controlled by ACEs or other supportive therapies. The treatment is cyclophosphamide plus prednisolone. And if the patient can't tolerate this, we can give them cyclosporin plus low dose prednisolone. And the third line is rituximab, which is superior to, to other options, but it is expensive. The secondary membranous is treated by treating the secondary cause. And with that, we're at the end of this video. Thank you guys for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support us more, you can by subscribing to the Patreon. Link provided in the description of this video. Thank you for watching and peace.